Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Marianne Talbot. I'm Director of Studies in Philosophy at the Department for Continuing Education, which is putting this thing on. Um, I'm delighted to see so many people. I've discovered, actually, that the one thing the, the word God is good for is getting people in. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been thinking I might, well, any lecture I give will be God and <laughs> philosophy and maths or something. But, um, uh, before we start, I need to, uh, just a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, one is, you'll have noticed the cameramen over the, uh, on the side there. Um, they're making a podcast of the whole weekend, uh, which will then be put up on uh, something called iTunes U, on the university site on iTunes U. So you'll be able to get hold of it and, and listen to it again, aren't you lucky, um, if you haven't caught everything the first time. Um, but I've been asked to ask you if you mind your voices being recorded. Your, uh, if you do mind your voices being recorded, if you have a question, come and ask me during the break rather than ask it here, because otherwise, willy-nilly, it will be recorded. Uh, but your face won't be recorded, so, so you will remain anonymous. Um, I think that's it for housekeeping, other than to introduce Stephen Law, who's sitting down here who, when I said, how would you like me to introduce you, he said, as master of the universe, of course. <laughs> Silly me. <laughs> but in between times, he's also a senior lecturer, I'm told these days, at Heathrop College in London. And he's also editor of a magazine called Think, which uh, is aimed, I think, at um, sixth formers. Is that right? No, general public. General public. Yeah. But, but non-philosophers, generally, people who are interested in philosophy. So you might be interested in his magazine, Think. And um, there's something else you do. You're provost of the Centre for Inquiry. Yes. Is I'm that right? a big poster tomorrow. Oh, good. Well, we'll have a big poster tomorrow. And I'm going to turn the lighting slightly... Now, can you still make notes and can you see the screen? Is that about right? Yeah. Good. OK. In that case, let's get started. Oh, I'm sorry, it's other people recording it as well. OK, I'm going to start by telling you where I'm coming from and also how I intend to proceed. OK, well, cards on the table. I believe in God, um, though I was an atheist till about 17 years ago. And later on today or maybe tomorrow, you're going to find out why I'm no longer an atheist, because I'll be telling you. Um, it's rather important that you recognise that I don't hold a brief for any particular religion. I'm not a Christian, I'm not a Jew, I'm not a Muslim. I don't belong to any organised religion at all. The other thing is, you may think this is a bit odd, uh, <laughs> when I'm standing up here talking to all of you about my believer. I never proselytise. There are quite a few people in the audience who know me quite well now. Uh, and they would be the first to tell you that I never proselytise. The reason I'm doing this um, is because, having read Dawkins' book and talked about it quite often with Stephen, um, I just find the arguments so appalling in them that I wanted to, to do this. So I don't think of it as proselytising. I think of it as doing philosophy, but you can make your own minds up. OK, so that's where I am. Um, I would love to demonstrate that God definitely exists, um, but I can't do that any more than Dawkins can demonstrate that he definitely doesn't exist. Uh, so you won't be getting, sadly, or if you do, it'll be inadvertent and I'll publish it and we'll... I'll give you a cut. <laughs> um, OK, my aim, and this is my only aim, is to give you reason. This is over my two lectures, not in this one lecture here. Over my two lectures, I want to give you reason to question the strength of Dawkins' argument against the existence of God. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm first going to identify his argument and set it out logic book style. That's literally how it would be set out in a logic book. Uh, and then I'm going to show that it's deductively valid, which is a good thing in an argument. Um, then I'm going to argue that, although it isn't obviously true, Dawkins' first premise, um, but strengthened, because it's actually not very plausible as it stands, um, I'm going to accept that, and I'm going to use it to show why I reject his second premise. 
So although we have a deductively valid argument, we have at least one premise that is, I think, um, demonstrably not true. Um, not saying it is demonstrably false, but it's demonstrably not true. So, OK. Now, we've got to get this to get anything at all about Dawkins' argument. This is the famous God hypothesis. I'll let you read it for yourself, but most of you, I think, will... Sorry? Some of them... <laughs> would you like to be in the front row? I'm sure somebody would swap afterwards. OK, I'll read it out. Um, there's a superhuman, supernatural intelligence that deliberately designed and created the universe and everything in it, including us. OK, that's the God hypothesis. And the whole of Dawkins' argument turns on that hypothesis. So here's his argument set out logic book style. Uh, premise one, the God hypothesis is a scientific hypothesis. Premise two, the truth of the God hypothesis is highly improbable. Conclusion, it's highly improbable that God exists. I think you can see that that's, that's a deductively valid argument, in that if the premises are true, the conclusion will also be true. Okay, so if you accept the premises, you have to accept the conclusion as a matter of reason. So I think it's a deductively valid argument, and for that, in that sense, it's a good argument. Um, Da, 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 da. Let's not repeat myself. OK, so if the God hypothesis is both a scientific hypothesis and highly improbable, then it's also highly improbable that God exists. OK, that's Dawkins' argument. Does anyone want to question my analysis of Dawkins' argument before I move on? Um, I'm lost right at... The start, because unless I'm doing Mr. Dawkins a disservice, one thing he criticises believers for is believing that without it being tested as a scientist would test it. So consequently, his statement uh, that it's a scientific hypothesis can't actually follow because it isn't something he can demonstrate as being true. Science. Well, actually, that doesn't matter at this point in the argument. Um, I, I certainly want to defend Dawkins against that, because um, he hasn't, I haven't yet given you his arguments for either of these claims, and I'm about to do so. So I think at the moment we should just take them... I mean, all I've said so far is that if these premises are true, the conclusion will also be true. I haven't said these premises are true, so you're not committed to, to believing that at the moment. I think what uh, Dawkins is really saying is that the claims of religion impinge on the reality of the world that, that is, is, is sensed by science and measured by science, uh, not that it's actually a hypothesis as such that, that could stand up to scientific analysis. It's just, it's just that those elements uh, that impinge... No, I, I'm sorry, he says quite categorically, and I've got the book here, and I'll look it up for you over the break, if you like. It is a scientific hypothesis. He, he, he makes that claim quite categorically and in those words. So, OK, uh, moving on. Um, if these are both true, then it's also highly probable that... Uh, it's, sorry, improbable that God exists. So my aim is to look briefly at whether we should believe that the God hypothesis is a scientific hypothesis, and I suspect that Stephen's going to address that one as well. Um, he did last time we talked. Maybe not. OK, well, maybe not so briefly. Uh, and then I'm going to concentrate in this lecture and on the ne in the next whether we should believe that the God hypothesis is highly improbable. OK, so quickly I'm going to look at whether God, the God hypothesis... <coughs> I'm going to start tripping over that any minute. God hypothesis is a scientific hypothesis, and then I'm going to look at whether it's highly improbable. OK, so we're looking at premise one. We're forgetting about premise two. We're just looking at premise one. Is the God hypothesis a scientific hypothesis? OK, here's Dawkins', Dawkins argument for this. He says the God hypothesis is either true or false, and it's made so by a scientific fact. OK, that's the first part of his argument. The second part of his argument is the universe with a god in it is very different from a universe without a god in it. Um, 
And for Dawkins, the satisfaction of these two conditions suffices for, it to, to, for the God hypothesis to be a scientific hypothesis. So let's have a look at the first one. The God hypothesis is either true or false. So let's go back to it. Here we are. There's a superhuman, supernatural intelligence that deliberately designed and created the universe and everything in it, including us. Well, it certainly looks as if that's either true or false, doesn't it? Would anyone, would anyone disagree with that? No, I wouldn't say it could be. Because it has dimensions to it. Part of it could be true and part of it could be false. But, but he is. But he is. That it's a bit deliberately designed, or created the universe, but not everything. So it could be partially true. But I'm sorry. No, this this is the claim, the whole claim, and the claim is that this claim is either true or false, and that looks to be true. Now, it is also true that parts of it yes. could be true or false. That is my only point here. Yeah. yeah. Um, but but we're looking at the whole claim rather than parts of it. Okay. okay. So I think we'll, we'll give him that. It is true or false. The other part of it, though, is that it's made true or false by a scientific fact, says Dawkins. Um, I'm just going to put a big query beside scientific fact because I'm not entirely sure what a scientific fact is as opposed to another sort of fact. So we'll come back to that, I think. So it's certainly true or false. And I, I think it's probably made true by a fact but whether, it, sorry, made true or false by a fact, in other words, there is a fact about the universe that makes it the case that that is either true or false. Whether that fact is a scientific fact, I, I'm less happy about, but I'll give him that just at the moment. Okay, secondly, what was his second claim? So we've given him that it's either true or false, and I've also said it's definitely made true by a fact, whether it's a scientific fact, let's leave it open. Um, the universe with a god in it is very different from a universe without a god in it. Well, I'm inclined definitely to give him that one, aren't you? I mean, if God exists, it's a very different universe from the universe from in which God doesn't exist. It may not be different in all sorts of ways that um, we would know. For ex at the moment, for example, we don't know whether God exists or not. So from our point of view, the universe is the same whether he exists or not, if that makes sense. But the fact is, it is a very different universe if he does exist to the universities if he doesn't exist. Should we give him that? Yeah. OK, good. So, satisfaction of those two conditions? No, no, no. OK. Oh, there's a troublemaker at the back. <laughs> Hello, Hugh. Isn't it, isn't it perfectly possible that God made the universe in the beginning and forgot about it? <laughs> it is, but that's the same point as this gentleman's down here. In, in that it, you're, what you're suggesting is that part of it is true and part of it isn't true, but we're not looking at that. But how would, it, how would the universe be different if God... Um, is, 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 it might know. only be different in its provenance. A bit like the Leonardo that was painted by Leonardo and the one that wasn't painted by Leonardo. Okay, They might not be different to look at, but they're different in terms of their provenance. Goodness, I've never shut Hugh up so quickly. That was, <laughs> must be something wrong. Uh, one more question, then I'm going to move on, because otherwise I'm going to... Surely the difference is the difference in the individual's perception. The universe is the same in both instances, but if you believe in God, then your perception of uh, what is coming through your senses as an interpretation of the universe will be different. Well, I think there are a lot of counterfactuals that would be difference. For example, if God exists, then he could answer our prayers. Would be true if God exists. Well, actually, it might be true if God doesn't exist. Sorry, that's a bad example. Um, I, don't, I don't have any problem with it. I, if you have the word there is, P, then the difference is whether P exists or not. And, and that is a difference, isn't it? And, and if P in this case is God, that's quite a serious difference. Just trying to be more profound than that. Okay. Sorry, say that again because it was your question. One person can see the P and the other person can't. I, 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 well, 
individual perception and the interpretation of the universe, which will be different between the two groups. Well, one of the things that's very important in this series of lectures, and actually I may as well do it now and get it over with, is this. There's a huge difference between people believing P and P's being the case. What's your name, sir? David Hill. David. David believes Marianne is wearing yellow. <laughs> oh, I knew this would happen. I knew this would happen. OK, we're just going to leave it at that. It's yellow, right? Yellow. Now, look, there's one sentence here and one sentence here. Now, could that be true, the big sentence? There's one sentence, Marianne is wearing yellow, embedded in another sentence, David believes Marianne's wearing yellow, yeah? OK. Could David believes Marianne's wearing yellow be true, whilst Marianne is wearing yellow be false? Yep, yeah. yeah. OK. Could uh, David believes Marianne's wearing yellow be false, whilst Marianne is wearing yellow is false? Yeah, yeah. yeah. that was true yesterday, actually, wasn't it? Both of them. <laughs> OK, um, could they, and uh, now I've lost track, uh, could that be false when that's true? Yep, and could they both be true, I think was the last one. OK, so the, the thing is, what makes that sentence, the embedding sentence, true is David and his beliefs. And what makes the embedded sentence true is me and what I'm wearing. OK? And the truth values of the two differ quite independently, don't they? So it might be that everybody in here believes that God exists. Ah. <laughs> um, but God doesn't exist, OK? Or it might be that everyone in here doesn't believe that God exists, and he does exist. Do you see what I mean? So actually... Uh, it's not our beliefs about God that are important, the important difference here. It's God himself. <laughs> We're not getting into that one either. Right, OK, do we understand why Dawkins believes that the God hypothesis is a scientific hypothesis? Yeah, OK. Um, and he thinks that its satisfaction of these two conditions suffices to make it a scientific hypothesis. Now, I think that uh, Dawkins is right. I mean, there are a few little niggles there, but I'll give him all of them. Uh, I think he's right to claim that the God hypothesis is either true or false, and that it's made so by a scientific fact. I, I've put brackets around the scientific, scientific just to indicate that I'm not happy about that. Um, and I believe that as well, that the universe with a God in it is very different from the <coughs> universe without. But I don't think satisfaction of these conditions suffices to show that it's a hy scientific hypothesis at all. Here are three other hypotheses that also satisfy Dawkins' condition, none of which is a scientific hypothesis. OK, you might or might not have heard of Bishop Berkeley, um, philosopher, Irish philosopher. Um, he believes that to be is to be perceived. Now, you may think this is a completely potty belief, but actually, it's very well argued for, and it's much more convincing than you might think. But let me try and explain what he meant by it. He believes that we could have no reason for believing that anything exists that didn't depend on our perceptions of it. OK? So why, David, you believe I'm wearing yellow. Why? When my friend told me to tell me that. You can see I'm wearing yellow. Yeah, OK. Why do we believe these chairs are blue? We can see them. Why do you think that um, there's carpet on the floor? Answer, I can feel it, and so on. So whenever, whenever we justify a claim about anything of that kind, about the physical world at all, we appeal to our perceptions. But we, don't, we want to say things like, well, hang on, it's not, there are all sorts of... This table would be here even at midnight when nobody's looking at it. What are you saying here? Barclay is saying, well, what you're saying is, if I were here at midnight, I would see the table. OK, so he's not appealing to a, an actual perception, but we're still appealing to a counterfactual perception. In other words, a, a perception that's contrary to fact, not an actual perception, but one that we might have. Um, 
believe me, and, and you are going to have to believe me here because I can't go through these three huge theories in the five minutes I've got for the time. But um, Barclay was saying this in response to um, somebody called Locke who believed that the world, the physical world exists and is as it is as what Barclay would have called mindless substance. It exists separately from us and has nothing to do with our perceptions. And Barclay didn't believe that. He believed instead that to be is to be perceived. Now, the difficulty with Barclay's theory is that it's not an empirical theory. Could you give me any reason for believing that something exists that doesn't involve perception? Could you empirically test the claim that to be is to be perceived? Yes, I mean, surely uh, in the early days of, of, of the theory of black holes, they in themselves were not perceived. Their actions, their, re <coughs> their actions upon light were what was perceived. And therefore, you were not perceiving the thing, but that didn't stop it existing, nor did it stop it believing. No, absolutely not. But, but of course, your, rely your belief that it exists relies on your perceptions of the things that you believe are caused by it. So just as you see the, the trails in a Wilson cloud chamber that tell you the atoms are there, um, and you don't see the atoms themselves, I may be demonstrating how out of date I am here, but um, uh, do you see, you still in that sense see the atom because you see the effects of it. So that's not a counterexample. Good try. But we do have perceptions that uh, are things that do not exist. Is that what? We do have perceptions of things that don't exist. Give me an example. Well, mirages, for example. Well, I'm sorry, hang on. What, mirages <coughs> don't exist? Or? The perception of what is seen in a mirage. No, we see a mirage and we falsely believe that something exists that actually is in fact a mirage. Well, there may, be, there may always be something misleading that you can see, which... Uh, um, no, it it's not what we perceive that's, that's well, actually, I'm, I was just going to say it's not what we perceive that's misleading, and of course that's not true. It is, or what we perceive is misleading, but we, it's our beliefs that are misled. Mirages do exist, but they don't exist as what we think they are. So where, as I'm climbing through the desert towards this mirage of an oasis, I falsely believe that there's an oasis in front of me, there isn't. What there is in front of me is a mirage. Or maybe it's in my brain. I don't, I don't know where it is. But well, in that case, uh, well, no, I don't really exactly say it. Uh, a hallucination, then, which, of course, is a stronger a misconception. Is this a dagger I see before my face? <laughs> well, is it? No, it's a hallucination of a dagger. My belief that it's a dagger is false. The hallucination is there. Well, it may not be there. It may be in here, but... Do you see what I mean? It's well, I see what you mean, but um, Barclay is saying that if something is perceived, it's a, to be, it is perceived. Or it, um, and, uh, you know, what, what, is, what is being, seen, uh, being perceived is, is not there. <laughs> no, what is believed to be perceived, i.e. the dagger, is not there. What is perceived, i.e. the hallucination, is there. Right, OK, I think I've established my point well enough. The fact is, there is no empirical test you can do to see whether Barclay is right or wrong. OK, so um, this is supposedly a scientific hypothesis, but it couldn't be falsified or um, confirmed by science. It couldn't be. That's because it's a philosophical hypothesis. Here's another one. The right action is the action that produces the greatest happiness to the greatest number. Well, OK, is there a scientific test that we could do for that? Is there anything that, that could, uh, uh, an experiment we could conduct that would show us that the right action is the action that leads to the greatest happiness, the greatest number? There isn't, is there? And, and one of the reasons there isn't is, is that the right, well, we could actually, we could con uh, cobble together an experiment by giving an instrumental definition of right. Um, we could say that, um, or and happiness, we'd have to do and happiness rather than all happiness, wouldn't we? 
Um, so we could say something like, um, oh, okay, the, um, the action that most people in this room would say was right uh, is also the one that would produce the greatest happiness to the greatest number taken on a, on a poll of people in this room and how happy they say they are. Do we think that this is a, a decent empirical test, this hypothesis? I think it's an exhortation. You think it's what? An exhortation. Uh, as it stands, that isn't an exhortation, it's, a, it's an assertion. Uh, no, because that's an assertion, the way it's put. I agree I could make it an exhortation, but as I haven't, I've made it an assertion, therefore it's either true or false, which an exhortation wouldn't be. Well, you can make the exhortation, the question would be whether, whether it would be a violation of human rights. Um, Fude, to uh, two African nations, two regions, uh, provide food and across the board to the population, okay, and a, both populations get the same amount of food, you know, uh, provide everyone with the same, with the same amount of food. One population, second population, provide them with a nutritionally viable amount of food, some people not, okay. So you get a very traditional utilitarian approach, okay. You interview the population afterwards, and so theoretically you, you can have an experiment. Well, the question would be whether you have any... Sorry, can I stop you? Can everyone hear? Um, I think enough people can hear. Do you see where this is going? Do you think that it's a reasonable test of the utilitarian claim? Uh, again, I, I think it totally misses the point. Well, a quick, um, what the gentleman was suggesting, because he has quite a nice soft voice, so I'll just make it louder, um, if I can. You divide a population into two and you give um, a certain amount of food aid to one lot and slightly less, same amount, both same both amount to both. But one lot you give everyone food. Right? In one lot you give everybody food, both groups. In the second lot you give a nutritional aid to as many people as you can cure, uh, feed to a, nutri a nutritional viable amount. So some people are going to die of starvation in the second group. Okay, in the quickly. second group you only give... Um, Right. Actually, sir, I'm going to stop you there because I don't know about anyone else, but I, I cannot see that this is a test of this claim. Th this is a claim about the, the morally right action is the action that leads to the greatest happiness, the greatest number. You can, okay, we can say, is this true? And we can put forward questions to test it. So, for example, you would test that by finding any action that you think is morally right and which doesn't lead to the greatest happiness, the greatest number, or that does lead to the greatest happiness, the greatest number, but isn't morally right. So we can test that by thought experiments. So what if I had suggested, you know, I, I'm very rich. You didn't know that, did you? But now you do. I'm very rich, and in my dying breath, I make Ray promise to give all my money to a, a cat's home. And there he is left with my body, and he's thinking, a cat's home? She must be joking. Um, I'm going to give it to the local children's home. Now, he's broken a promise. You might want to say that this is an immoral action that's going to lead to the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Is this a counterexample to utilitarianism? But we don't need to answer that because we're not conducting a scientific experiment here, are we? We're conducting a thought experiment. This is what philosophers do when they want to test a, a, an entirely universal claim like this. Once again, this is not a claim that can be empirically tested. I do see hands up, but I'm just going to move on a bit because I'm slightly worried about time. I'll, I'll come back to the two people I saw in a minute. Um, and finally, the one I'm going to look at is the future will always be like the past. Well, this is Hume. Hume believes that um, any empirical experiment you do is always going to rest on the principle of the uniformity of nature, the principle that the past will be... Sorry, that the... The future will be like the past. So if every swan you've ever seen has been white, you might extrapolate from that to think the next swan I see will be white. And then if you see a black swan, you'll know that you were wrong. Okay? But you see another white swan, and that's going to confirm your impression or, or confirm it to some extent and so on. 
every experiment that you could ever do rests on the principle of the uniformity of nature. If A causes B, then the next A will cause the next B, and so on. So, again, can we test this empirically? Well, no, we can't. And the reason we can't is because every single empirical experiment must rely on this. Okay, you cannot, con you cannot put together an experiment that doesn't rely on this. Therefore, this is not itself uh, testable by science. Um, sorry, it may, maybe there is some talk about um, some very constants of nature not being constants of nature. So what they were yesterday may not necessarily be what they are tomorrow. <coughs> they may result in some minor between the past and the future in terms of what Yes, but if you're going to try and uh, experiment to show this, you're going to have to rely on that change being predictable in some way, aren't you? Yes, I don't know if it would be yet. <laughs> no, well, no, um, well, no, maybe it won't be. I, I mean, we, this, the, the principle of the uniformity of nature doesn't say nature is uniform. It says we must assume nature is uniform. So for, we are, we're, none of us know whether we're like Russell's chicken. Russell's chicken, um, this, it was a farmer's chicken. And every day in the history of the life of this chicken, the farmer had come out in the morning and fed it. And this morning, the farmer comes out and the chicken goes, ooh, breakfast, runs off and gets its neck wrung. Um, well, how do we know that we're not in that position when it comes to um, the sun rising in the morning? Answer, we don't. We assume that nature is uniform. It may not be, but that's not the point. The, the point is, in order to conduct any experiment, we've got to assume that it is. So, again, this is a, another hypothesis that satisfies Dawkins. So, OK, none of those hypotheses is a scientific hypothesis. They're all philosophical hypotheses, uh, and that's why they're not uh, testable in Dawkins' way. Um, let me just finish this point, and I'll come back to the three people I saw asking questions. OK, so I gave you three hypotheses. They all satisfy Dawkins' two conditions. None of them is a scientific hypothesis. They're all philosophical hypotheses. And the difference is that whereas the truth or falsehood of scientific hypotheses can be established by observation and experimentation, and I've put truth or, or falsehood in brackets there, because um, those of you who, who know about science will know that Popper argued very successfully that actually science can't confirm theories. What it does is falsify them. So whether we say true or is irrelevant, actually. If, if we're going with Dawkins' argument, we ought to say true. But actually, it's the falsification of a hypothesis that we're really concerned with. So whereas the truth or falsehood of scientific hypotheses can be established by observation and experimentation, that of philosophical hypotheses can be established only by reason and argument. So I think, um, well, actually, no, this is a good time. And the people I saw wanting to ask questions, there was a young woman there. Don't put your hand up if you're new. One woman there, one man there, and one man there. Was it you? Yeah. Yeah. OK, so um, I was wondering if um, the three cases you just showed us, if they do fulfill Dawkins' conditions. Um, so the first one you had was uh, Dawkins' condition was that it's either true or false and made so by a scientific fact. And it seems to me that if something is made a case by a scientific fact, then its truth value should be open to be verified. Through well, the that's, that's why, why, that's why d the reason I don't like the word scientific fact is it could be just a straightforward question-begging argument, which is that science can establish it. If, it. if science can't establish it, it doesn't count as a fact, in which case Dawkins is begging the question. But I didn't want to attribute to him the question-begging objection. I just wanted to say, let's leave out the word scientific here, because what really matters is that it's a fact. If you add scientific, it begs the question, whereas if you take scientific out, it doesn't beg the question. OK, think, ab think about it and come back to it if you don't like it. Um, two things. Well, I think uh, possibly this can be tested. Uh, we talked about the greatest happening to the greatest number. Well, that was put into practice. I mean, the Whig government that came to power after the Great Reform Act did try to do that very thing. And it worked out in a way disastrously because they increased much poorer. 
Well, they introduced the poor law, which said, in order to encourage people to work, we will put people, put people in work houses, and that became the most unpopular um, social tradition of the 19th century. Yeah, it was found one thing. And I think I would also, I would also say, I don't think that the fact that the sun may or may, the sun may, or may not rise tomorrow morning, I mean, the reason the sun, we, we think, rises tomorrow morning is that the earth is rotating west to east. And if that failed to happen, then we would be there. I mean, you know, that would be the end of the laws. I mean, it is a, a, an observable scientific fact. That is why the sun rises isn't something that may or may happen. Like you might see a black or a white spot. Okay, let's take two, two putative um, falsifications of um, the, the hypotheses I had up there. So the gentleman says that the Whig government in... Now, this is where his... Okay, the Whig government in 1832, thank you for providing that, um, uh, did try that. Um, so presumably what they tried to do was um, create policies that produced the greatest happiness for the greatest number, okay? <laughs> because they believed it was the right thing to do, okay? And what you're saying is that those policies were, were a disaster, and that shows that this is wrong, okay? Who thinks that that's a falsification? Or, sorry, who doesn't think this is a falsification of this theory? Put your hand up. Ooh. Okay. Uh, would somebody like to explain why it's not a falsification of this theory? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I just, I hardly know where to start, actually, and I'm wrapping that, because um, they believed that this was the right action, but they may have been wrong. They may have believed that w the poor law was going to produce the greatest happiness of the greatest number, and they were wrong. Neither of these things is a test of that whole sentence. This is a claim about morality, about what the right action is. So it can't be tested by an empirical claim like that. Secondly, you say that um, the reason the sun rises in the morning is because the laws of nature say that it must. Okay. Well, it's true that in the past the laws of nature have always made the sun rise every morning. And because we believe that the laws of nature tomorrow are going to be exactly the same as the laws of nature today, we believe that the sun will rise tomorrow. But why do we believe that the sun will rise tomorrow? Answer, we believe in the principle of the uniformity of nature. Why do we believe that the laws that make the sun rise tomorrow will continue to be the same tomorrow? Answer, because we believe in the principle of the uniformity of nature. It, it's entirely circular to try and justify um, one regularity on the basis of another regularity because um, the regularity then again needs to be justified and it'll be based on that again. And any attempt you make to justify the principle of the uniformity of nature will be circular. I guarantee it. <laughs> <laughs> Two bites at cherry, not allowed. Yeah. One, one more question. I'm, then sorry, I'm, I'm sorry to come back to this, but I think it's fundamental to this whole thing. And that is the Lee Dog hypothesis. <coughs> if you go back to the exact words there. Uh, well, I'm sorry. No, no, um, please, please, just. We have lots of questions, questions when I finish to have a chance. So he's so talking I about a designer God, a designer God. And all he is not talking about a generality of, of, of. If we are talking about a God that didn't design. Sir. I, I have a, a whole line of argument that I've got to get through, and I don't want to go back to an, a bit of the, an earlier bit of the argument when I've got on to this bit. I promise I'll come back to you and deal with this question when I finish the presentation. Can I do that? Yep. Thank you. Okay, um, so to go back to where I was here. Um, so I've said that um, the hypotheses satisfy Dawkins' conditions, but none of them is a scientific hypothesis. They're all philosophical hypotheses. And the difference is that the truth and falsehood of scientific hypotheses can be established by observation and experiment, whereas philosophical hypotheses can be established only by reason and argument. So I think a better way, and this is where I'm going to strengthen Dawkins' first premise, because as it stands, I don't think it's, it's very good. I, uh, I think there are too many reasons for 
dismissing it. So let's strengthen it by giving him this. A better way of characterising a scientific hypothesis would be as a claim, the truth or falsehood of which is demonstrable by observation or experiment. Okay, that would make an, a hypothesis a scientific hypothesis. Uh, and on this account of a scientific hypothesis, the God hypothesis would be a scientific hypothesis only if it could be shown to be true or false by observation or experiment. Okay, so the question then becomes, could the God hypothesis be shown to be true or false by observation or experiment? Okay, do you see where I'm getting to? Do you see why I'm asking the question? Good. Uh, now, many would argue, and Dawkins deals with them at length in his book, many would argue that the God hypothesis is simply not the sort of claim that could be tested empirically, okay, that because it's... Uh, maybe because it's a philosophical hypothesis or maybe because all sorts of reasons that they would think. Okay, Dawkins rejects their claims and I'm going to concede that to Dawkins. I'm quite happy to, to give in this and say um, I will accept premise one, the idea that the God hypothesis is a scientific hypothesis uh, as long as we interpret scientific hypothesis in, in my terms because that's frankly just a much better way of doing it than... Um, Dawkins suggests. So, um, I accept for the sake of argument premise one of Dawkins' argument, the claim that the God hypothesis is a scientific hypothesis, a hypothesis that could be shown to be true or false by observation or experiment. Okay? Are you all with me? I accept Dawkins' first argument, first question. Uh, two uh, One there. The, the, uh, the scientific hypothesis is not only got to be demonstrable by experimental observation, it's also got to be coherent. Well, as Dawkins doesn't question that, let's not question it ourselves either, because it would take us into a completely different realm. So let's... He takes it to be coherent, and so am I taking it to be coherent. We can argue about that in the question and answer session at some point, if you like. OK, one other question there was. No, oh, I'm sorry, sir. I missed you earlier, didn't I? So let me come back to you now. Yeah, I'm sorry, but uh, what I wanted to comment on was the idea that the future will always be like the past. Uh, one of the satisfactory conditions. But, um, sorry, could you speak up a bit? Could you speak yes, that um, one of the comments was that uh, Hume, the future will always be like the past. And I just wanted to comment on an interesting book uh, called Process and Reality, where the idea that present is past, past is present, and future is void. Now, if that were the case, the comment by Hume would be inappropriate and wouldn't necessarily prove anything. Um, and indeed, I I've come on to that. I find myself... Rather thought that. Well, really, also, God is timeless, or the idea of God is timeless. Well, God's being timeless would be irrelevant um, to the claim that the future is like the past, because God's outside time, um, so there'd still be past and future inside time, even if God were sitting outside time. Um, on your past and is present and so on, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I don't feel qualified to comment on that. Um, so I won't. Right. Okay. I'm going to move on to the second premise. So if you remember, let, let's just go back and have a look at the argument. There's the argument. Uh, the God hypothesis is a scientific hypothesis. And what I'm doing is I'm accepting that, um, but slightly changed. It's on a slightly different interpretation. Uh, but I'm accepting that. That is uh, true. The argument is deductively valid. So if there's anything wrong with it, it's got to be here. OK, that's the premise that I'm going to argue uh, against in the rest of this lecture and in the uh, lecture this evening after dinner. OK, so let's uh, go back. So I'm looking at premise two now. Um, Dawkins says that the God hypothesis is highly improbable 
because it's highly probable that science will eventually make God redundant. Okay? That, that's his claim. It's highly probable. And I'm sorry about all these probable bits. We all know that Dawkins is absolutely certain that God doesn't exist, but the, the fact is he couches it in this terms because it, it matters to him enormously that he's not seen as... Um, he, that he's seen as sceptical in everything, which I think is fair enough, So, and I'm happy to go along with that. OK, the God hypothesis is highly improbable because it's highly probable that science will eventually make God redundant. OK, though Dawkins doesn't distinguish them, there are, in fact, two ways in which science make, might make God redundant. Um, firstly, uh, science could make God redundant by making every theory that postulates the existence of God either scientifically respectable or scientifically redundant. OK, so two ways in which God could be made redundant. The, th the theory that postulates God is either made scientifically respectable or scientifically redundant. So what do these mean? Let's have a look. OK, to make a God postulating theory scientifically respectable would be to eliminate God from the ontology of that theory. Uh, that would mean that the theory would be shown to be capable of doing its explanatory work without God. So what's this mean? Well, let's have a, let's have a look. OK, every theory postulates the existence of various things. OK, so, so let's say you see sickness in cows and you postulate magic. Uh, and witches and things like that as an explanation of, of how sickness in cows arises. Now, what you're doing there is you're constructing a theory that postulates the existence of magic and of witches, OK? Do you see? Or you see tracks in a Wilson cloud chamber and you postulate the existence of atoms to explain the tracks that you see. Um, so... Um, what a theory tries to do is it tries to explain things that are observable um, by appeal to things that are lying behind, that are not observable. And then it will give some sort of characterization of these things. Uh, and that characterization is going to be um, what the thing must be like if it's to do the job that the theory says it has to do. OK? So um, if you're going to uh, explain cows becoming sick by appeal to witches and magic, well, actually, by appeal to witches, how do the witches make the cows sick? Answer, magic. Easy, isn't it? So here you have two postulates. And if you want to um, make the theory scientifically respectable, um, you could say, well, hang on, magic? That's not very respectable, is it, in, in scientific terms? What, what is this magic? Ma Let's get rid of the magic. Let's say that cows make... Uh, sorry, <laughs> witches make cows sick by putting poison into their drinking water, OK? So magic has become putting poison into the drinking water, and, and so the theory has become respectable. See what I mean? So um, if we can get a theory that postulates God as an explanation for something, and what we do is we say, well, actually, we don't need God because we can do all this explanatory work by means of these other things here, um, perfectly scientifically respectable things, not God. OK, do you see what that would be? So it would be to, to eliminate the, an ontology, by the way, I should have said uh, an ontology is a list of things that exist. So some of you in this room probably have God on your ontology. Some of you don't have God on your ontology. Some of you have fairies on your ontology, perhaps, and others don't. Some have ghosts and so on. Um, it's your list of the things that you believe to exist. So every theory has its ontology, and included on that ontology, in, sorry, in that ontology will be all the things the theory postulates as existing. And if God is one of them, and we don't think God is scientifically respectable, and let's say we don't, um, then we'll want to make, if we keep the theory, but try and find something else that'll do the explanatory work other than God. We can get rid of God, the theory is fine. Okay? The second way of showing that God is redundant is to um, 
to make a scientifically, sorry, a God postulating theory scientifically redundant is to eliminate the whole theory and with it any need to appeal to God. And we do that by replacing it with a theory that makes no mention of God. So if you like, in the first case, we save the theory but get rid of God. And in the second case, we get rid of the theory completely. See what I mean? And God with it. So in each case, God becomes redundant, but in the first case, because uh, the theory's been made scientifically respectable, i.e. God's been junked from the theory, and the second case, because we've got rid of the theory completely. Okay, see the difference? Okay, Dawkins reasoned, so just to, to remind us of where we are, actually I'm reminding myself of where we are as well, so Dawkins has claimed that uh, science will eventually make God redundant. I've said that there are two ways in which he might do that, by making it respectable or make it uh, redundant. Um, it doesn't matter which of those ways you choose, but what Dawkins is saying is that science will eventually do that with every theory that postulates the existence of God. And his reason for saying that is an inductive reason. Um, uh, induction uh, goes back to the, the uh, principle of the uniformity of nature. If this has happened this way many times in the past, you will expect it to happen again in the future. And so Dawkins believes that science has often in the past succeeded in making God postulating theories redundant, possibly by making them respectable. And he thinks that science will continue to do this in the future until there are no God postulating theories left. Okay, so God will become completely redundant. Um, for example, science has undoubtedly shown that there's no need to postulate God to explain th the existence of things like the bacterial flagella. Is it flagella? Does anyone know how to pronounce that? Flagella, is it? Thank you. The bacterial flagella motor. Uh, this is done completely satisfactorily by Dawkins' theory of evolution. I, it had to happen once, didn't it? It'll happen again, I'm sure, before the end of the session. Okay, Darwin's theory of evolution. Um, you could, actually, you could forgive me for that one, couldn't you? Sometimes. Um, okay, um, what he says is that uh, people who believe in God postulate God, and, and he, um, he's very rude to the Jehovah's Witnesses. In, uh, do that. And actually, I had two round the other day who gave me a, a leaflet, and it's still in there. It is amazing, actually. Um, in the leaflet, it says, how could this amazingly complex thing have come apart except by design? Answer? Evolution. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> evolution. I mean, the evolution is just a no-brainer here. Once you understand how evolution happens, the idea of complexity arising from simplicity um, over eons of time is just a no-brainer. It works. It explains this, and it, it explains this in a way that fits with our other theories. It, it's a very satisfying explanation. Um, so I, for one, completely accept that we don't need God to explain the evolution of the bacterial, I've forgotten already, flagella, Mosa. So Dawkins is right to claim that science has succeeded in making many God-postulating theories respectable or redundant. And I think he's undoubtedly right to think that science is going to continue to do this. Uh, it's, there's no doubt whatsoever that science is, is just pushing down barriers in all sorts of ways um, and will continue to do it. And good on it. But this is a very long way from the claim that it's highly probable that every theory, and notice uh, I'm emphasising every theory, every theory that postulates the existence of God will eventually be shown by science to be respectable or redundant. And I'm slightly tempted to, to um, refer to something somebody once said to me, which was, um, if you imagine the monkey up halfway up the tree on the way to the moon, and he's saying, nearly there. <laughs> he's about to hit a principled reason why he won't get much further. Um, so far, it's worked very well. <laughs> but, um, and I think that to claim on the basis of past experience 
that um, science will show every theory, every God postulating theory to be respectable or redundant. Well, okay, here's the question I'm going to ask, which is, is there any God postulating theory such that it's unlikely that science will ever make it respectable or redundant? And I'm going to answer, yes, there is. I think there is such a theory. Um, and therefore, I've got to answer three questions. Firstly, I've got to say what this theory is. Secondly, I've got to say why we think it's God postulating, because th uh, there'll be quite a few people who, who won't agree with me that it's God postulating, so I'll have to offer some defence of that. And thirdly, I need to say why we, should th why we should think it's unlikely that science is ever going to make it respectable or redundant. So my aim in the rest of this lecture, two minutes before we then have questions, is to answer these questions very briefly, just so you have the outline of my argument. Um, then I'm going to introduce two objections to my answers. They'll, they'll be very obvious objections. You'll think of them yourself as, as we go through. And then in my lecture, next, next lecture, I'll fill out my argument by responding to those objections. Okay, so all I'm, I've got two minutes left, so I'm not going to go into the arguments. And if you ask me about the arguments I will go into in the next lecture, I, I won't be able to answer your question because I'll tell you to wait. Um, but I'm going to answer the questions briefly, introduce two objections, and then fill out the argument by talking about those objections in the next lecture. OK, here are my brief answers. So firstly, what is the theory that postulates God and is such that it's unlikely that science will ever make it respectable or redundant? Answer, it's folk psychology, which I'm <coughs> going to call FP, because all these are beginning to get me down. Um, it's the theory we use when we attribute mental states to each other in our attempts to make each other intelligible. So um, when somebody puts their hand up, I think that they, um, they have a question for me. They want to ask a question, and they believe that by putting their hand up, um, they intend to, to make me respond to their question. Okay, so the attribution of beliefs, desires, intentions, etc., is, is a sort of folk psychology. It's an attempt to explain our behaviour, each other's behaviour by the attribution of theoretical states like beliefs, desires, intentions, and so on. That's folk psychology, and that's the theory that I believe is both God postulating and such that science, um, there's reason to think science won't ever make it respectable or redundant. OK, why is it God postulating? I think it's God postulating because its use essentially depends on the assumption that we are rational, believers of truths and lovers of the good. That's a quote from the person who, who talked most about this particular theory. Um, OK, why does folk psychology depend on the idea that we're rational? Well, just very quickly, because remember, I'm not filling in the argument now. Um, but whereas our explanations of the physical world depend on the principle of the unity of nature, our explanations of each other, not unity of nature, you know what I mean, <laughs> uniformity of nature, um, our explanations of each other depend on the principle of charity, as it's called. So if, what's your name? Gorinda. 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 If Gorinda says something that I think, oh my God, that was stupid, um, I can think two things there. I can think, oh my God, that was stupid. Gorinda's stupid. I'm not going to talk to him anymore. Or I'm going to think, oh my God, that sounded stupid, but Gorinda's intelligent, rational person. That's more like <laughs> <it>. <laughs> you prefer that one, do you? <laughs> Therefore, I must have misunderstood him. Okay, Gorinda, why did you say that? I mean, surely that's not right. I mean, as I get to know you better, I'll say, Gorinda, you must be mad. What? <laughs> Why do you believe that? And you'll tell me your reason, and, and then we can have a jolly good argument and sort it out. And what we're doing in doing that is cooperating in the search for truth. But in order to cooperate in the search for truth, I've got to not dismiss what he says because he's mad, because he's irrational. Instead, I think, as, as Quine said, my interlocutor's silliness is less likely than my bad interpretation. 
Uh, and the assumption of rationality underlies the use of folk psychology in the way that the assumption of the uniformity of nature underlies science. That's what I'm going to claim. OK, but I've got a third question to do yet. Um, OK, so in doing this, it postulates things that I believe, um, and I will explain, are very difficult, if not impossible, to explain without appeal to God. So why do I think that science is never going to make folk psychology respectable or redundant? OK, uh, I think there are inductive reasons for believing that it's unlikely science will ever make folk psychology respectable. OK, so inductive reasons. Every attempt that's ever been made in the past has failed. And I think that we will continue to fail because I think like the monkey up the tree, we're about to hit a principled reason for failure. Um, so those are inductive reasons. And I think it's unlikely that science will ever make folk psychology redundant. And that's because I believe we really are rational believers of truth and lovers of the good. And I'll need to explain a lot more about that, obviously, later on. So that's the outline of my answers to the questions. And I'm now going to give you the two objections to my claim, which you've probably already come up with. Um, and the discussion of these objections will have to wait till the next lecture. OK, objection one is nonsense. Of course science is going to make folk psychology re scientifically respectable. You know, a belief, a, a belief is going to become a neural state or something like that. Of course it's going to make science, folk psychology scientifically respectable. OK, objection two. Science will probably make sci folk psychology scientifically redundant. It will show us that we don't need beliefs, desires, etc. Um, psychological states. Those are the two objections, and in my lecture, next lecture, I'll explain why neither of those objections succeeds in establishing Dawkins' second premise, and I will therefore give you reason for thinking that Dawkins' argument is not as good as you might otherwise have thought, which is what my aim was. Good. Oh. <laughs> Right. Questions? Okay. Gorinda. Gorinda, absolutely. This won't be a silly question, hopefully. If, let's assume for a moment that your FP theory will never be provable in the way that science requested. But what if every other 10 to the power n theories are provable by science? Then... Irrelevant. All we need is one theory. But that's not sufficient, surely. Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> No, listen, if, if I say everyone in this room is, is um, I was going to say tall, that's such a bad example, isn't it? <laughs> okay, everyone in this room is wearing red, and down here I've got someone wearing blue. Isn't that enough? For what? For belief in something super For belief that my claim that everyone is wearing red is false. You only need one, if you make a universal claim, you only need one counterexample. There's a difference, because the FP thing, you can say, hasn't yet been uh, Ah, yeah. No, you're absolutely right, and I'll finish by saying that um, even if my arguments are established, this, this shows only that there are serious problems with making FP scientifically respectable or redundant. It doesn't show that... That means we won't ever. No, you're quite right. But I can, uh, I mean, Dawkins can no more establish his inductive argument than I can establish mine. But what I hope I'll do is give you good reasons for believing in mine, just as Dawkins gives you reasons for believing in his. Notice I left out the word good. Ah, uh, oh, right, yes, we'll come. Every, every argument that uh, Dawkins generally makes as a, on a scientific basis in the God delusion is against a designer God. And in his hypothesis, if we go back and read that again, he defines what he's arguing against in his hypothesis is a designer god. I think there are other kinds of gods that can yeah. only be argued about from a philosophical point of view. And Dawkins puts out philosophical arguments, but that's not his definition of a scientific argument. And I think that you're putting up a straw man here in, in going after uh, <laughs> something uh, that is really purely philosophical. And, and trying to treat that as being scientific. And that's not what Dawkins said. Not his hypothesis. <laughs> <laughs> There's a designer of 
who would like to look for where I Dawkins says that the, it's the play of page 25? Right. Um, okay. Uh, you believe that the first premise that I've got here is both false and not what Dawkins says. Okay, and, and do you think it's false? Because you think the God hypothesis is a philosophical it's hypothesis. True, but there's a certain amount of probability that there is no designer God, scientifically. You cannot prove that, you, that, that in, on philosophical concepts about God, that you can't, you can't prove with science that those are not... Listen, uh, I, I completely agree with you that if the God hypothesis is a philosophical hypothesis, not a scientific one, then science is whistling in the wind if it tries to disprove it. Completely agree. Um, I actually left it rather open. Uh, I said I agreed, I accept Dawkins' first premise for the sake of argument. I think actually there are quite good reasons for saying that the good God hypothesis isn't a philosophical hypothesis. But I have accepted for the case of argument that it is, and I completely and utterly disagree with you that Dawkins doesn't think it, it is a scientific hypothesis. And I'd like to find... It's in your foil. It's on my what? Well, Leo, but that's just what I say, whereas we're looking for what Dawkins says. Look, I can't find my reading glasses, so you've had it. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm sorry, we'll... we'll We'll have to put that argument on one side. I'm very happy to have it with you um, at another time, but I absolutely am a certain, and, and it's not often as a philosopher I get to say this, <laughs> so let me say it again. I am certain <laughs> that Dawkins believes that the God hypothesis is a scientific hypothesis. I, I am really certain of that. <sighs> I enjoyed that. <laughs> What does he say? Read Contrary to Huxley, I shall suggest that the existence of God is a scientific hypothesis like any other. Yes, but he, he also says it more definitely yeah, than that. Later on, he talks about the probability uh, aspects. Uh, oh, yes, but... A smidgen of being made his biological. Right. OK, Bill, you had your hand up here. Um, in the section where you say that folk psychology is not postulating, you mentioned in the section where you say folk psych uh, psychology is God postulating, you mentioned that we are believers of truth, you mentioned that we are lovers of the good, you mentioned rationality and the principle of charity, you didn't mention God. Uh, no, but on the next slide I then went on to say I think these things can only be explained by appeal to God. Uh, no, I, no, I haven't. Um, but that's one of the things that... I, I agree with you, it's very important, but, but that's... Okay. How can you show that um, the fact that you think, Paul, that um, people are rational is itself a rational belief? Um, well, I didn't say that I think people are rational any more than I said that I think the universe, uh, the nature is uniform. What I said was, just as we have to assume that nature is uniform in order to conduct a scientific experiment, so we have to assume that someone is rational in order to attribute beliefs and desires to them. So I didn't actually say that we are rational, uh, and in fact, one of the things I'm going to question in my next lecture is whether we are rational. But, uh, but I did say, and I continue to say, that we have to assume rationality if we're, if we're going to understand each other. Nobody must speak to me during the break, by the way, otherwise I won't have any voice for this evening. <laughs> when, uh, you, you said that you, should like to, you would like to demonstrate that God definitely exists. And uh, in some of the conversation a bit earlier, OK, past and future didn't matter. God is or could be outside of time. If God could be or is outside of time, therefore also outside of space, what kind of existence are you postulating? And is it the same kind of existence that any scientific theory of Dawkins or anyone else could test? I, I don't really need to answer that question. I can just say I don't know. Um, I mean, I, I'm no 
expert on God. Um, I believe in him, but, but I think, oh, you're going to hate this. I think his nature is mysterious. <laughs> um, I do think he's outside time. No, he's not a material thing, no. But that actually, I don't think you're a material thing either, but um, never mind. But if it's outside of time and space, science can never touch it, can it? So it's it's again. If there's something is, I would say is rather than exists, <laughs> outside of time and space, science can't begin to touch it. Well, this is why some people believe that the God hypothesis isn't a scientific hypothesis. Um, but, but I've said that I'll go along with Dawkins for, the, for that and thinking it is. Uh, and also, we mustn't forget that um, it's not just what is that can be seen, it's also the effects of that thing that can be seen. So even if something's outside space-time, maybe its effects can be seen within space-time and therefore... Do you see what I mean? Um, Charles. So the fact I know a few people's names, incidentally, shouldn't intimidate those of you whose names I don't know, because there are a lot of people here who've, who've come to wind me up. <laughs> Is that fair enough? <laughs> They're members of the Philosophical Society. Um, I can't remember the exact quote, but you, you had somewhere that um, scientific hypothesis is true or false. Is what, sorry? True, true or false? false. Yeah. And I'm assuming there you're doing that literally. Literally true, absolutely true, or absolutely false. Well, I think um, Dawkins is certainly assuming bivalence, which, which is uh, interesting. Yeah, and I'm going along. Bivalence is just... Um, bivalence says that any sentence that you have is either true or false, that there aren't any truth value gaps, nor is there any third truth value. Um, the point so I'm trying to make is that, unless I'm mistaken, we generally agree that the only areas, domains, where there is absolute bivalent truth values are logic or perhaps mathematics. When you get into science, all is probability. Okay, in some fairly obvious things, uh, the probability may be asymptotically close to being one, but it is never 1.0 absolutely. But, uh, but I still think, if you say the probability of P is 58% or something, then that's going to be either true or false. No. So bivalence holds anyway. No. So... P is true... OK, the truth of P is 58% probable, let's say. That is either true or false. Yes. So bivalence holds. <laughs> when, when you got to the point where you were saying that, that therefore, the logic after was something like, well, therefore... Um... Look, actually, can, can I stop you, Charles, because it's not me assuming bivalence, it's, it's Dawkins himself. Uh, and actually, I, I have a, a quite a yen for intuitionism in mathematics and therefore against bivalence, but, but I'm prepared to accept bivalence for the sake of argument here. Um, when you think how horribly complicated the argument would become um, if I translated it into probabilistic terms, even though I'm sure it could be done, I think you'll sympathise. Okay. I, I do find this uh, folk psychology theory of yours rather... I mean, I agree with what you're de uh, demonstrating, but I do think it's a rather ponderous example of, of what to, to use. I'm sorry, it just happens to be the theory I think is the exception. Well, uh, uh, yes, but I was going to come on to say, I mean, Dawkins, I mean, if he's got a god, it's Darwin, yes? I mean, he's, he's a Darwinist par excellence. Now, I've read Darwin. I mean, not everybody's read The Origin of Species, but I've read it, page right way through. Well done. Uh, <laughs> that's what happened at the time. Uh, the thing is, there's no, nothing in there that suggests how a animate life uh, could have come from in inanimate life. Now we do, um, uh, you know, it's, it's outside um, uh, uh, natural selection, it's outside uh, evolution altogether. And I don't believe, this is a bit of a thought experiment, that science today, if, I know this is not possible, but if it were presented with an inanimate world and there was nothing, how it would possibly uh, be able to forecast from that material that, that 
that would one day be anime, right? I think it's well, interestingly, I, I would disagree with you. I'd, I'd argue on Dawkins' side for that one. He says at one point that he believes that um, chemists will, within the next few years, create life in the laboratory, and, and I think he's probably right. But it won't be um, evolution. No, it's a separate thing. Yeah, no, I mean, he actually, in, a, in obje an objection to that, he would say that even very improbable events do happen occasionally and that the, um, the development of life from non-life was maybe a very improbable event, um, but it happens and it happens here and we know that it because here we are. Oh, no, they haven't. No, no, I'm certainly not saying they have, but, um, but he thinks they will. Oh, yes. And... I, I'm not as worried about that as, as I am about various other things, he says. I just have difficulty with this idea that the scientific hypothesis has to be either true or false. Because I've understood that to be scientific, a hypothesis has to be falsifiable. It doesn't mean necessarily to falsify it at this moment, but it has to be capable yes. of being falsified. But that means that even if you absolutely believe it to be true at this moment, you can never be sure that it won't one day be proved to be false. But, but both Dawkins and I have taken that on board because Dawkins claims that the God hypothesis is a, a scientific hypothesis which he believes to be false and it's a, it's a scientific hypothesis that actually there are a lot of things in it I'd quarrel with but for the sake of argument I, I am saying I believe to be true. So neither of us is saying that it is true or false. Dawkins is saying that science will show that it's false, and I'm saying that science will not show that it's false. So we're, we're both entirely consistent with a, with a thoroughly Popperian line on falsification. <laughs> Promise you. Isn't there a kind of a, a debate here which sits in the background, which is... What sure there of, at least there's a lot of one. Is there at least one debate about what kinds of facts it is that science can work on mm -hmm. so as to make God redundant? Oh. I mean, it's no coincidence, is it, that a lot of people who are religious rely on so-called miracles to support mm -hmm. the existence of God. If you take something which <coughs> science would really struggle with, turning you know, a bucket full of seawater into a bucket full of isn't that the kind of thing which Darwin, you know, Dawkins is just going to say, well, it just didn't happen. And, and at that point, then, doesn't this whole debate just go nowhere? Because yeah. the, people, the people that believe in Christianity and, all, and the other great religions, <coughs> don't they just say, well, here is a set of facts that you will never be able to make God redundant in relation to it by the scientific method. All you can say about this fact is you just disagree that they occur. Uh, well, um, I agree that if you base your argument for the existence of God on the existence of miracles, then you're going to have, find that very sterile argument almost immediately. Um, I agree. But, but that's not the argument I'm making, and in fact nothing anywhere near that argument, because... Um, I'm not sure I even believe in miracles. Um, so so I, I completely agree that, that the miracle argument is, is a no-hoper. Um, the argument I'm going to give is completely different. I think that the d debate about what counts as scientific um, is, of course, underlying everything here, because um, the two objections I'm going to look at i.e. folk psychology can be made respectable and folk psychology can be made redundant, um, are, are both going to rely on what we count as scientifically respectable and what we count as scientifically redundant. But I think I'd better go through those arguments before we talk about the discussion underlying them, if you see what I mean. But, but please don't take me for someone who says that miracles are why God exists, because that is not why I think God exists. Uh, one of the, the arguments, the, the, the saying that any sufficiently advanced technology is apparently magic. 
Which is the podcast. Maybe we said that. I mean, and, and my feeling about the bivalence of, of scientific theories is that theories are either false or it's not false. Well, you're, that, you believe in bivalence. Yeah, that does it. And, and, and what Dawkins is saying that, yes, it may be so that at the moment arguments that we consider to be philosophical because we can't see where the science comes in. So and what he's saying is just wait. Keep, keep waiting because oh. the science will get there in the end. Absolutely. What appears to be a philosophical argument now will appear to be a science, a scientific argument when we find out. I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because there are two objections that Dawkins would put to my case quite independently. I mean, they're, they're, one is that he would say that um, I'm bringing the argument from personal incredulity, i.e., I can't see how anything could possibly explain this except God, therefore God, okay? Uh, and the other one is the God of the gaps, which is, um, oh, look, there's something that science can't explain, therefore God must exist, okay? Um, I hope you'll agree after my presentation that although I am saying that there's a gap that can't be filled by science, Mine is not a knee-jerk God of the gaps argument. I'm not saying, oh, look, there's a gap. God will fill it. I hope you'll also, although I am saying I can't see how science will ever explain this, I hope you'll agree with me at the end of my lecture tonight that this is not a knee-jerk <coughs> argument from personal incredulity. And with that promissory note, I'll have to leave you because I, I can't go into the arguments now because we've only got five minutes left. Is that fair enough? In addition to uh, talking about the, the, the creator God, there are a number of other aspects to God which he discusses. Um, miracles is one of them. Uh, the other is his prayer. Now, it's not, and he does discuss this, of course. This well, is a situation which is actually scientific testimony. In other words, it's Dawkins' God, or your God for that matter. Is it essential that he exists and listens to prayers and acts on them? Because this is scientific testimony. Scientifically tested, as he shows. In, in the <coughs> How important? I don't think it's scientific. Um, Dawkins pours scorn on on a, a test that was done. Um, there was a control group and another group of people um, in hospital, and the first group were prayed for. The, the control group weren't prayed for, and it was um, the question was: Did did the ones who were prayed for get better any quicker? And you'll be surprised to hear that the answer is no. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> and this shows that... Oh, was it? Oh, right, OK. <laughs> I think, <laughs> yes, you're right. You're right, I'd forgotten about that. <laughs> yes, oh, my God, if I'm being prayed for, I must be really ill. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that is just... I, I'm sorry, I just I can't take that seriously. Neither can Dawkins. Yes, why not? Why not? But it was sponsored by the Temple but it's, Foundation. Well, I still think it's... I still can't take it seriously. It's possible because it's, if you can't take two groups or three groups of people who are ill and say that they are alike in all respects, and therefore... Well, test, I mean, it's just a ridiculous one objection is there are too many variables. Yeah, um, but, uh, but I just... Absolutely. It's the same way we <laughs> No, David. Well, no. Well, that may be a question you're interested in. It's yes. not one I'm looking at oh, here. Because I think it's part of the scientific argument if you can show scientifically that that particular aspect of God is not true. I, I think if you really could show scientifically that prayers are not answered, I, I mean, I don't think you could, but even if, I mean, well, then why can't I just be a deist? You know, that God exists, but he doesn't intervene. I mean, yeah, lots yeah, of people that, are deists. That, yes, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there was a question in, in the middle. There was somebody... I, I did see you, but there was someone who wasn't you <laughs> sitting behind asking a question. No? Oh, right, OK. That's a good thing in a question. Um, Patrick, and then I'll come back to you. I'm, I'm, I'm Deep sort of, thought here. No, I'm struggling to, to. It's just such a massive, massive, massive subject to try and unpack. And, and um, 
Given the arguments, do you mind if I look at that later on? Because um, I, I think, um, <coughs> I mean, I think actually something that Stephen's likely to say later, because I'm sure he's not going to leave the god of Eth out of this, is he? No, didn't think so. I think that'll come up later in, a, in probably quite a big way. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I, I, did, I did say that, Jennifer. I'll come back to you in a second. Um, with re regard to folk psychology or theory of mind, um, isn't this something that uh, an evolutionary psychology would say uh, conferred advantage during evolution and uh, was selected for and is there for an adaptation? Mm. Oh yes, of course. Yeah. So in that sense, science is heading towards an explanation for it. If you think so, sir. <laughs> um, I want to go back to your very first uh, form, mm. I believe in God. Mm -hmm. And you've said in some of your explanations, sorry, you, you said just now something. I believe in him; he is mysterious. Right? You've, these are things that you've, you've said. And um, Dawkins refers to Einsteinian religion, mm. by which I understand is non-personal, non-personal God, no superhuman, no no aspect of agency or personality at all. Um, and there's a lot of people now that work in the field of complexity, like Stuart Kaufman, that um, are not scientific reductionists. Sorry, they're not scientific reductionists. And this, they're saying there's something more than science. There are other ways to know the world. And they are desperately trying to avoid the word God. <laughs> desperately. I so saw I something very funny about that the other day. Go yes, on. but I'm trying to understand what sort of God you believe in. <laughs> Um, I'll answer that tomorrow. <laughs> because if I, if I tell you, because the God I believe in is, is actually not very like a lot of other people's gods. And I'm in talking in these lectures as if I believed in the God that everyone else believes in. Yeah. And, uh, because that's <coughs> what Dawkins is doing. Oh, is he? Everybody yeah. yeah. I mean, in a different sort of God. What do you say? <laughs> <laughs> Just ask everybody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tomorrow you'll tell us about yours. Yes, I will. Yep, yep. Uh, one, time for one more question. Yes, and I think I'd just like to reiterate, I think, what a couple of gentlemen at the front were, uh, I think, trying to, trying to get to. And I think Dawkins defines God very narrowly uh, in the, the, the God that he's arguing against. And I think to prove that another type of God exists doesn't necessarily deflect from what Dawkins is trying to do in this book. Well, I, I'm not trying to prove another type of God exists. I mean, you're quite right. I mean, God... Uh, God. <laughs> I meant Dawkins then. <laughs> oh! <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> um, right, now I've, I've lost my thought now. Um, uh, yeah, OK. Um, there are lots of different arguments for the, for the existence of God. Um, several of them tend to be the God as theoretical entity argument. That's the only argument we're dealing with here, because actually that's the God, that, sorry, that's the argument for, for God's existence that Dawkins takes seriously. But of course there are lots of other arguments for the existence of God, and, and nothing that's said here um, this weekend by me anyway is going to say anything against those arguments. I, I actually, I, I'm actually quite sympathetic with the idea that God is a theoretical entity. Um, so I don't have a problem with that. But you're quite right that there are lots of other... Yeah, no, I, mean, I think what I'm trying to get to is that, although I think Dawkins 
isn't explicit about what it thinks about, for example, an energy in the universe that sort of floats around us and doesn't really get involved with what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. But I think he's very specific about saying it's a, a god that's a designer god that's sort of interfering in our. He he's arguing against a personal god. What well, a personal god, i.e., one that intervenes and yeah, exactly. yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I mean, I think that it said that in the God Hypothesis, yeah. didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So, so that the God Hypothesis encapsulates what Dawkins arguing against and what I'm arguing. I'm not arguing for. I'm arguing against Dawkins' <laughs> arguments against it. If you see what I mean. Right, that's it. Time for coffee. <laughs>